Hey folks, welcome. My name's Becca, and I'm just one of many members here at Destiny Harvest Church. I'd love to start out by telling you a little bit about our church. First, Destiny Harvest is located at 1720 Belmont Avenue, right off of the security exit of 695, so it's super easy to get here. Also, this is a church about encountering God and discovering your destiny. Speaking of destiny, let's check out this latest message. Look at the person next to you. Tell them you look really good this morning. A lot better than last week. <laughs> Tell them it must be the extra hour of sleep. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> Today we're jumping into a new series called Points of Passion. Points of Passion. And there's so much in this story of the Good Samaritan that we can unpack, and I'm not going to grab it all, but this is one thing that really blows my mind. The man was asking Jesus, basically, what is expected of me as a Christian? You ever wondered that? Okay, I know there's 66 books in the Bible, there's all these things, but God, what is it that you want from me? And God said, here is what I expect from you to love me with your whole heart, with every fiber of your being, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think it's so interesting that this attorney, he looked at Jesus and he said, okay, I need to love you with my whole heart, and I need to love my neighbor as myself, love God with my whole heart. I can do that. God's perfect. He loves me. He's great. But who exactly is my neighbor? You know, a lot of times as being a Christian, this relationship isn't as much the issue as this relationship is. And God is saying, if you're going to be complete, if you're going to accomplish what I've called you to accomplish, it can't just be your relationship with me, but your relationship with me should cause you to love other people the same way that I love you. You know, as I was thinking about this message, points of passion, let me just give you the analogy that popped into my mind. You ever had a soda that was shaken up, or, or maybe you shook the soda up and you could just hear it fizzing and all the pressure that's going in, don't leave me hanging. Has that ever happened to you? Good deal. All right, we're all on the same page. Now, here's what happens. If you open that soda up just a little bit, but you don't release the cap, all the pressure inside is just going to ooze out and dissipate, but nothing's going to happen. But if you open that top all the way, that soda is going to come flying out of it and get on everything that's around it. This is what happens when we encounter Christ, when we run into God, there is an explosion that happens inside of our lives. There is a fire that is birthed within us. You ever heard the term in church, I'm on fire for God? You ever heard that before? Church folk like to say that. Are you burning for Jesus? I don't want to burn, but I think so, yeah. <laughs> the Bible says, though, it says never be lacking in zeal. But here's one thing that I believe is so important. That zeal in our life that we've received from an encounter with God must be directed somewhere. If we don't direct the encounter that we're having with God in certain directions is going to dissipate from our lives. You know, if you shake that soda up, but you don't open it, and then you shake it up and you don't open it, eventually that soda is going to be flat. There's strange people who like soda, but they don't like it with fizz. So they'll shake it up and they'll open it and they'll shake it up until all the fizz is gone and then they'll drink it. If that's you, we could pray for you after service. God will set you free. You will be okay. But that soda, there's nothing to it. And I dare say, as a believer, if all we do is receive from God, oh God, I thank you for your love and your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy, but we don't direct that. We don't point our passion somewhere. 
eventually our zeal for God is going to begin to dissipate. I have a challenge for you. If you're in here and you've been a Christian maybe six months or a year or 10 years or 20 years, and you look at your Christian life and you say, you know, I can't really say I'm seeing myself grow from glory to glory to glory. Let me challenge you by saying this. Who are you pouring into? Because what God is desiring is that as he pours into you, you're able to pour into other people. And if we're not willing to pour into other people, God's like, well, why would I pour into you? The Bible says, out of our belly shall flow streams of living water. Unfortunately, some of us are more like swamps than streams. We receive, oh, that was a good word. Oh, that was, man, I got five pages of notes. Oh, that was a good word. Week after week, that was a good word. But it's sitting on you like a bad steak you had three weeks ago. If we don't do something with that word, point it somewhere, we only have half of what God called us and created us to walk in. So this month, we're going to talk about where can I point what God is doing in my life. He is bringing a passion, a zeal, a fire in my life, and I need to point it at somebody. I need to point it some where it's so interesting this lawyer came to Jesus and he was all okay with having a relationship with God it was just loving his neighbor that was a problem and this lawyer he was like hold on who exactly is my neighbor and, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this one carefully because I don't know if any of my neighbors are in the building or maybe you invited your neighbor to church and they finally came so I don't want to avo- uh, offend your neighbor but have any of you ever had that neighbor you, you know what I mean by that? That neighbor that when it snows outside, they take all the snow off of their sidewalk and pile it on yours. That neighbor that when your trash cans are blown in the middle of the street, they just swerve around it and keep on going and say to each his own. This lawyer was saying, Jesus, you need to define exactly who I'm responsible to, what he was trying to do. How can I get away with the least amount of responsibility to those around me so that I could just receive from God but not really be accountable for those? And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to tell that story. That story is closer to home than we can ever imagine. It was talking about a man, and chances are he was a Jewish man because he was coming from Jerusalem and he was going to Jericho. And it, but the distance between Jerusalem and Jericho is 19 miles, and it was known to be the most dangerous road of the time. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking I was going to name some roads in Baltimore, PG County, or Southeast D.C., but I don't want to offend anybody. So I'm just going to say it was that road, the road with the blue light up in the, in, in, in the <laughs> circling, and, and the cops were coming through with the lights and all this different kind of stuff, and the guy goes through. And it says he gets robbed and he was left half dead. Now, this is what I believe it's talking about. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that Satan is the ultimate thief and that he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And a lot of times in life, as we look around, we'll look at poverty, we'll look at destruction, we'll look at homes, countries, entire countries suffering and without And we'll say, God, how in the world could you allow that to happen? And God is saying, I didn't allow that to happen. That country or that family or that person was a victim of the ultimate thief. And I'm expecting you to be my hands and my feet and to do something about what you see. We planned this series months ago, or a few weeks ago, but I don't think it's coincidence as God laid it on our heart that he knew the Hurricane Sandy was coming through. And it just fits in the perfect timing when our country is in a time where they need help, where God is reminding his church, that's your responsibility. Don't just sit in a pew and say, thank you, Jesus. You're God alone. Thank you for forgiving my sins. But he says, go out and be my hands, be my feet, Help those who have been robbed by the enemy. So there's three things that I want to bring to you this morning. And the first thing is this, that generosity is a passion of God. Generosity is a passion of God. This lawyer asked Jesus, he said, who is my neighbor? And this is why he asked. He was trying to say, 
How little can I get away with and still be a child of God? What is the minimum requirement so I can tick off my good deed for the day and go on about my business? How much can I get away with? But here's the problem. That's opposite to the nature of God. We serve a God that doesn't enjoy generosity. He is generosity. We serve a God that is over and above. Let me give you this verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It says this, talking about God. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Let me read that one more time. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, I know the baggage series is over. We're not talking about bondage. We're not talking about baggage. But I just have one more area of baggage that I just have to confess so I can walk on in freedom. Is that okay? <laughs> just go ahead, Pastor. Take your time. There is one thing that God's still working on me, and I just can't seem to get past. And that's when I go to Chick-fil-A and buy french fries. And someone sitting next to me says, can I have one? 